Hi guys, this is the review for Unit 9, Biological Diversity. And if you would like to follow along with me, I will be going through the learning objectives on page 139. Before I start going through these learning objectives, I just want to remind you that what you need to do to do well in Unit 9 is to memorize pages 141 and 142. So if you look at pages 141 and 142 in your lab manual, you will see this, these two pages summarize all the different taxonomic groups that you should know and also all the characteristics that distinguish each one of those groups. So you should not only know the taxonomic names, like you need to memorize the different kingdoms and the different phylums. You should also know the examples of organisms that belong in each one of those taxonomic groups. And those are listed on page 141 and 142 in parentheses. And you should also be able to list the characteristics that defined those different taxonomic groups. So there's three main things that you need to learn from those two pages. In order to get started, let's look at objective one. To construct a flow chart to sort organisms into categories based on shared characteristics. So you're going to want to be able to actually construct these flow charts. And before we talk about some of the rules you need to follow when constructing these flow charts, Let's look at an example flowchart here. So at the top here I have listed five, the five different kingdoms that you should know. Monera, Protista, Fungi, Plantae, and Animalia. So remember that Monera are bacteria. So here we have a flowchart that's categorized, using characteristics to categorize and separate these different kingdoms out. And we can see that the first pair of characteristics that we're using to separate them out is single cell versus multi cell. So every group that's going to be listed after this branch here has to be single celled. So if we look here, we can see Monera is listed here. And based on how this flow chart is constructed, we can tell that Monera are single celled and prokaryotic. If we look at Protista, remember these are also single celled organisms we can see that they are single-celled and eukaryotic. Notice that for each pair of branches, that they're pretty much opposites of each other. So we have prokaryotic and eukaryotic. So those are two separate categories that we can use to separate out these single-celled organisms. If we look down at the multi-celled organisms, we have separated them out first as no, having no cell wall versus cell wall. The only kingdom that's multi-celled with no cell wall is Animalia. And the kingdom that's multi-celled has a cell wall and is heterotrophic is fungi. And then multi-celled organisms that have a cell wall and are autotrophic would be plantae. And this is a way, again, that we can separate out these different groups based on the characteristics that they have. All right, so some of the rules you need to follow when doing these flowcharts include each branching point must have exactly two branches. So there's always two branches coming out from each point, and you can see that here. At each point, there's two branches coming out. Also, each branch must be characterized by biologically relevant characteristics. So you must use the characteristics listed on page 141 and 142. These include characteristics like autotrophic, heterotrophic, eukaryotic, prokaryotic, and so forth. One thing that you cannot list as a characteristic on those branches is the taxonomic names. So you cannot say, oh, well, this is a plant and this is an animal and, and use that to separate out things. Okay, you cannot use any kingdom names or phylum names um, to separate out stuff. Also, just remember that it must be fully resolved. Each branch must only have one organism at the end of it, and you should have no empty branches at the end. Okay, so that's really important. So let's do a practice flow chart. At the top here, I have listed a couple different organisms. Blue-green algae. Remember, blue-green algae is a photosynthetic type of bacteria. Okay, so that's really important to know. And this is one of the organisms that's listed on page 141 that you should know. The next group of organisms that I have listed is ferns, and then maple trees, starfish, and sponges. 
So I want you to use this backbone of a flow chart that I have constructed here. Pause this video and see if you can fill out the characteristics correctly that would go into each one of these branches and then list the correct organism at the end of each branch. There's more than one way or more than one correct answer when doing these flow charts. You just have to make sure that everything makes sense. All right, so let's go over these answers. Remember, remember that there's a lot of different ways you can construct these flow charts. So how I decided to separate them out to begin with is heterotrophic versus autotrophic. Okay, so you might have used different characteristics, but this is just the way that I decided to start this. Notice that heterotrophic and autotrophic, these are opposites of each other. Heterotrophic, again, means that an organism has to get its food from its environment, whereas autotrophic means they make their own food. So which two groups up here are heterotrophic? Well, it's going to be the last two. These are two types of animals over here, starfish and a sponge. So we would put starfish and sponge at the ends of these two branches. And what characteristics can we put on these branches to distinguish a starfish from a sponge? There could be a couple of different things that you could think of here. Uh, however, uh, what I decided to use here is their type of symmetry. Starfish have five-fold symmetry, which is unique to that group. And sponges actually have no symmetry at all. So that is a way that we could separate out and distinguish between starfish and sponges. Now we have three organisms left. We have the blue-green algae, the ferns, and the maple tree. So how can we separate them out down here? So let's look at our second branching system here. What characteristics could we put down there? Well, how could we separate out the bacteria from these plants? Well, one thing that you might have thought about, there's multiple answers here again, is prokaryotic versus eukaryotic. Remember that bacteria are made up of very simple cells that do not have a nucleus. They do not have any membrane-bound organelles like a mitochondria, chloroplast, all those things. So they're called prokaryotic. And if you look here, we could separate out these two things as prokaryotic or eukaryotic. So I put the blue-green algae, or again, these are photosynthetic bacteria here. And then for the eukaryotic organisms, that would be the ferns and the maple tree. Another way you could have separated these two things out is single-celled versus multi-celled. Okay, so again, there's many different ways that you can make these flowcharts work. How could I separate out ferns from maple trees? So here, now you want to think about the way that, ways that we distinguish plants. And one thing that we know that they differ in is how they reproduce. So ferns reproduce by actually creating spores, and that's how they disperse themselves, whereas maple trees create seeds. So that is one way that you could separate out ferns from maple trees. So hopefully that helps. Um, if you want practice with this, just pick, you know, four or five different living organisms and then just try to construct a flow chart from them. Number two says to recognize the relationship between the taxonomic categories, kingdom and phylum. So when we're looking at taxonomy, we're looking at ways that we can name organisms. And we tend to name them based on the groups of organisms that they are more closely related to. And if we want to get more inclusive or more broad, we would use categories like kingdom. So the kingdoms of living organisms are very broad categories, and each kingdom usually contains many different organisms that have some shared characteristics. And then if we want to get more specific within the kingdom or separate them out even further, we would break it down into phylums. And then we could break those phylums down into classes classes down into orders, orders down into family, families into genus, and genus into species. So species, that categorization is the least inclusive and the most specific. However, you don't need to know anything except for the five kingdoms and then a couple different phylums of plants and animals. Let's look at an example of why we use this, these taxonomic classifications. Well, let's look at the taxonomic groupings for white-tailed deer, cows, and humans, so you and me. If we were to look at their taxonomic groups, this is what we would see. And taxonomy is extremely important because it helps you 
to see, it helps you see which organisms are more closely related to others. So you can see that white-tailed deer, cows, and humans all fall within the kingdom Animalia. They're all within the phylum Chordata. They're all within the class Mammalia. And then you can see it's where we, when we get down to the orders, this is when they get separated into different orders. So white-tailed deer and cows are in the order Artiodactyla, whereas humans are in the order Primates. So you can see just by this that since white-tailed deer and cows are in the same order, they are more closely related to each other than they are to humans. So this is a great benefit of using these taxonomic classifications. So let's look at the classifications that you should know or the taxonomic groups you should be familiar with. You need to know five kingdoms, Monera, Protista, Fungi, Plantae, and Animalia. And then there's four phyla within plants that you should know. Memorize these phyla and what type of organisms belong in each one. And then there's eight animal phyla that you should memorize as well. Remember on the exam, spelling doesn't count but you want to be as close as possible because if we can't sound it out, then you're probably not going to get the points for it. Objective 3 says name the five kingdoms of organisms and identify the characteristics that distinguish them from each other. So here is a summary table. I recommend actually copying this down and then studying this over and over and over again because it summarizes the main characteristics that are used to distinguish between the five kingdoms of living organisms. Let's first look over these five kingdoms again. So Monera include bacteria, and they also include a group of bacteria called blue-green algae. So don't get confused by this word algae. Um, it is a type of bacteria and not a true algae. Uh, protista, these are mostly single-celled organisms, and these are found pretty much in every different types of environment, and mostly you'll find these in uh, bodies of water. So if you go to a pond or a stream and you just take a drop of water and look in a microscope, you will see many little protists swimming around in that microscope slide. Fungi are things like mushrooms or bread molds, and then we have plantae our plants, and then finally we have our animals, animalia. So what's the one of the main characteristics we can use to distinguish these kingdoms? One is whether they're made up of a single cell or if they're made up of many different cells. So is each individual made up of just one cell or are they made up of many different cells working together to create that individual? Well, if we look at the Monera and Protista, each individual is just a single cell that does everything that that individual needs to do to stay alive. Whereas if we look at fungi, plants, and animals, each individual is made up of many different cells, so we call them multicellular. If we look at the type of cells that make up these different organisms, we can categorize them as either prokaryotic or eukaryotic. The first cells that existed on Earth were called prokaryotic cells. So you can remember this because pro means first. Okay, so these were the first cells. These were cells that existed a long time ago. And these cells, you could think of them as very primitive or very simplified. They have DNA inside of them, but there's no nucleus surrounding the DNA. Okay, so they, are, they have no nucleus. They also have no membrane-bound organelles. So remember, organelles are just specialized structures within a cell. In prokaryotic cells, none of these organelles or specialized structures inside a cell have a membrane surrounding them. So this means that they do not have mitochondria, they do not have chloroplast, they do not have Golgi bodies, rough or smooth endoplasmic reticulums. Okay, so they don't have any of these organelles that contain a membrane around them. Okay, or compartmentalization. It's a hard word to say, compartmentalization. Okay, so they have no compartments within them. Uh, one type of organelle that prokaryotic cells do have, however, are ribosomes. And if you remember, ribosomes make proteins. 
So ribosomes don't have a membrane surrounding them. So prokaryotic cells, if you were to look at a prokaryotic cell, what does it look like? Well, it pretty much just has this DNA floating around inside of it, and it has tiny little ribosomes, little protein factories within it. However, um, if you look at this summary table here, you can see that the only kingdom that's made up of prokaryotic cells is the bacteria. Bacteria were the first types of organisms on this planet. And it makes sense that they're made up of prokaryotic cells or these very primitive type of cells. However, all the other kingdoms are made up of more complex cells and we call these cells eukaryotic. Karyotic, that end of that word means nucleus. So you, the prefix of that, you means true. So eukaryotic cells have a true nucleus. That's what that word means. And they also have um, all those membrane-bound organelles like mitochondria and chloroplasts and so forth. Okay, so that's really important to, to understand uh, the difference in these types of cells. Now, if you look at the third column, this is another way that we can distinguish these different kingdoms, and that is based on how they obtain nutrients or how do they obtain food. And organisms can either be autotrophic that means that they make their own food. Auto means like self, okay? So you can do something on by yourself. So autotrophic means that they make their own food. Heterotrophs, on the other hand, have to obtain their food from their environment, okay? They can't make their own food. Some of these different kingdoms have some species that are heterotrophic and some species that are autotrophic. So for example, Monera, or bacteria, contain both heterotrophic organisms and autotrophic organisms. Most bacteria are heterotrophic, where they get their, their nutrients by absorbing it from their environment. Whereas there are some types of bacteria, we call them blue-green algae, um, and they are autotrophic, so they can actually make their own food. And they use photosynthesis to make their own food. If we look at the next kingdom, protista, we can see that the protists can, some of them are autotrophic and some of them are heterotrophic. The two heterotrophic type of protists that you should be familiar with are paramecium and amoeba. So they have to obtain nutrients from their environment, whereas euglena is a type of protist that can actually photosynthesize, so it's autotrophic. Fungi, fungi like mushrooms and stuff like that, are not photosynthetic. Many students actually think mushrooms can photosynthesize. Well, they cannot photosynthesize. They actually have to get all of their nutrients from their environment. And they are heterotrophic by absorption. So they actually absorb nutrients and food through their cell walls into their cells. So mushrooms actually have like a root-like network where they can absorb their nutrients from. Plants, on the other hand, are strictly autotrophs. If we look at the animalia, or the animals, they are heterotrophic, but they are heterotrophic by ingestion mostly. So that means that they actually have to ingest through some sort of cavity. They can ingest their food um, from the environment. The last characteristic we can use to distinguish the different kingdoms is whether they have a cell wall surrounding them, their cells. Remember that all cells have a cell membrane surrounding them. However, some organisms actually have a protective cell wall surrounding the cell membrane, and that provides extra support around their cells. Notice that bacteria, or the kingdom Monera, fungi, and plants all have cell walls surrounding their cells, whereas protists and animalia do not have a cell wall surrounding their cells. Objective four states, name two kinds of Monera and describe the ecological functions of each. So the main two types of Monera, remember the kingdom Monera contains the bacteria. Uh, there's two types of bacteria you should be familiar with. One, we're just gonna call bacteria. And the other is called blue-green algae. So what do these types of bacteria share? Well, they're all single-celled. They're all prokaryotic. Remember, prokaryotic is a characteristic that distinguishes the kingdom Monera from all the other kingdoms. Uh, and also, Monera have cell walls. 
Some are autotrophic and some are heterotrophic. Most bacteria are heterotrophic, so they absorb nutrients from the environment. However, there are some bacteria, and this bacteria is called cyanobacteria, or more commonly is called blue-green algae, and they are autotrophic. This means that they can make their own food, and they, are, uh, they make their own food through photosynthesis. This might confuse some of you because you might be thinking, well, they're prokaryotes. Prokaryotes don't have chloroplast, right? Because they have no membrane-bound organelles. But that doesn't mean they can't photosynthesize. What you need to photosynthesize are pigments that can absorb solar energy. So although bacteria, like blue-green algae, do not have chloroplast, they do have special molecules called pigments that can absorb solar energy and that they can use, therefore, to capture that energy and transfer that energy into ways to actually make their own food. Okay, so, so blue-green algae are capable of photosynthesis. Objective number five says describe three shapes of bacteria cells and recognize the use of the prefixes Diplo, strepto, and staphylo. So you should just memorize the terminology that we use to describe the shape and the arrangement of bacteria. And bacteria, although there's many different types of them, the type of shapes that they come in is actually not very diverse. So they can be rod-shaped. And if they're rod-shaped, we call that bacillus. If they're spherical, we call that coccus. And if they look like a spiral, we call that spirillum. We also name bacteria based on their form, or in other words, their arrangement. So bacteria cells can actually be arranged as like a chain. So each individual is kind of attached to the next individual. And if they're arranged as a chain, we use the prefix strepto. So here we can see that this bacteria is a chain of rods. So we would call this bacteria streptobacillus. Remember bacillus means rod shaped. So based on the name, you can tell that it's a chain of rod shaped bacteria. This next group of bacteria, you can see that it's arranged in a cluster and we call clustered bacteria staphylo. So how would I name this cluster of bacteria here? Well, they're clustered and they're spherical, so it would be called Staphylococcus. Finally, we can see the bacteria down here are arranged in pairs, and we would use the prefix Diplo. And since these are paired spheres, we would call this Diplococcus. Have any of you ever had strep throat? Here is an image of the bacteria that causes strep throat. How do you think we would name this bacteria? And why do you think it's called strep throat? Well, we know that strepto means chain, and you can see that this bacteria exists as a chain. Well, it's a chain of spheres, so we call the bacteria that causes strep throat streptococcus bacteria. So make sure that you memorize these terms in case we ask you to name um, a type of bacteria on the test. Although none of your objectives really go into talking about protists, you should definitely know the kingdom protista, you should know its general characteristics, and you should know a little bit about the three examples of protists shown on this slide. For this lab class, you want to characterize protist as single cell because most of them are single cell with a few exceptions. Okay, so protists are single celled organisms, they are eukaryotic, and they can be either autotrophic or heterotrophic. So if we look at the three examples here, I have a, some amoeba, euglena, and paramecium. Amoebas and paramecium are heterotrophic, so they actually engulf their food from the environment. Whereas euglena is autotrophic, it can actually photosynthesize. All three of these organisms also have mechanisms that allow them to move. So I'm gonna play a video here. Uh, you can see the amoeba here is about to engulf these paramecium here. 
Here you can see the euglena and it moves using this long flagellum or this little like whip. And then the paramecium, they move with little hairs that surround their entire body called cilia. They're hard to see in this little video, but you'll be able to see them moving um, a little bit. Another thing that you want to notice is that all of these organisms have structures within inside of them, right? You can see compartments within the cell. So each one of these organisms is a single cell organism. There's many little compartments and vacuoles and stuff like that inside of there because they are eukaryotes. So eukaryotes have a lot of complexity inside the cells. So here you can see the amoeba is digesting these paramecium and secreting digestive enzymes and breaking them down. Amoeba like to just engulf everything they approach. All right, so objective six says identify the hyphae, mycelium, and sporangia in fungi and note the functions of each. So before we get into that, let's talk a little bit about fungi. Fungi are very, very diverse. There's many different types of mushrooms. And their general characteristics are that most of them are multi-celled. So each individual is made up of many different cells. They're eukaryotic. They're heterotrophic by absorption. So they actually absorb nutrients from their environment. They cannot make their own food. And they have cell walls. One thing that you might not be aware of is that the largest living organism in the world is believed to be a mushroom. There's a single mushroom that is actually 2.4 miles wide. And they estimate that it could be about 2,400 years old. So you might be kind of questioning this and thinking to yourself, well, how could a mushroom be 2.4 miles wide? Like, wouldn't you be able to see that from outer space? Well, actually, most of a mushroom's life is spent underground. Whenever you see these little caps coming up, these are actually just reproductive structures. So whenever a mushroom's not re reproducing, it's spending its entire life underneath the soil. Most of a mushroom exists as a root-like network underneath the soil. So when I'm talking about that mushroom that's 2.4 miles wide, that means its root-like network goes out 2.4 miles and it extends under the ground for that far. And we call this root-like network under the ground mycelium. So the mycelium increase the surface area for them to absorb nutrients from the environment. The mycelium or these root-like structures are made up of tiny little cells called hyphae. The hyphae are these tiny cells of the mycelium and this is where nutrients is absorbed from the soil. Only whenever the mushroom is going to reproduce does it create these reproductive structures that you probably think of when you think of a mushroom. And they use these for reproducing. Underneath the mushroom cap, you'll see all these tiny little spores. And these spores are reproductive cells. And each spore is capable of creating a new organism or a new mushroom. Some uh, mushrooms will actually disperse these spores slowly into the air. And the benefit of that is that these spores are carried by the wind. They'll move far away from the original, the mushroom. And then they can, if they land on an environment that's suitable, they'll grow into a whole new mushroom. You probably are very familiar with bread mold if you've ever let your bread sit out in the kitchen too long. And if you look at it closely, you might actually see these little stalks growing out of the bread mold. And at the end of these little stalks, you'll see a little tiny capsule. Those little capsules are called sporangium, and they are actually little structures that contain many, many, many spores. So whenever those sporangium rupture, spores will spread out and they'll go land on other pieces of food that you have in the kitchen. Okay, So it's good to discard your bread as soon as you start seeing that bread mold forming. So make sure that you are familiar with these Memorize these terms and make sure that you know what each one of these structures do in a fungus. Objective 7 says distinguish between the phyla bryophyta, pterophyta, conifera phyta, and anthophyta in the plant kingdom and recognize examples of each. So remember that 
The kingdom plantae includes multicellular eukaryotic organisms that all have a cell wall and the kingdom plantae is strictly autotrophic so they can all make their own food. There's four main groups or four main phyla of plants. These are the bryophyta, which contain the moss, which you're probably familiar with seeing like moss carpets in the woods. Uh, then we have pterophyta. These are the ferns. So the bryophyta and pterophyta are the most, I guess, primitive plants. Okay, so these were the first types of plants on the earth. So they're going to have a lot more primitive characteristics. Then came along more complex plants, and these include the conifera phyta. These are any type of plants that produce cones. So it's really easy to remember that this name because cones is in the name. So these include things like pines, hemlocks, cedars, uh, also fir trees would be considered conifers. And then any plant that produces flowers is called anthophyta. Anthophyta are the flowering plants. So these plants not only produce flowers, but they also produce fruits. Some examples of anthophyta would include things like roses, redwoods, vegetables, fruits, shrubs, or any non-coniferous tree. So any tree that you see outside that doesn't produce those needles and, and cones would be considered an anthophyta. So what characteristics can we use to distinguish these different plant phyla? Well, one is their structures within them. So are they vascular or are they non-vascular? When we use this term vascular tissue, what we're referring to is that inside some plants, they actually have these little vessels within the plant that actually distribute nutrients and transport nutrients and water throughout the plant. By having vascular tissue, this allows a plant to get a lot taller. So if you look at these pictures of the four plant phyla, which one of these is not very tall? Well, the only one that's not very tall is the moss. So what this tells us and what we know is that moss are non-vascular. They don't have these special vascular tissues within them. All the other three groups of plants, the pterophyta, coniferophyta, and anthophyta, are all vascular. Okay. Uh, another way that we can distinguish plants is how they disperse their young. So the more primitive plants, the mosses and the ferns, bryophyta and pterophyta, reproduce using spores. So they have special structures on um, these plants. So mosses actually create these long stalks and the spores are produced on the end. And ferns, if you turn over a fern leaf when it's reproducing, you'll see these little clusters of spores on the bottom part of the fern leaf. So this is how they disperse their young. Moss and ferns do not produce seeds. The seed producers are the more, um, I guess, recent plants to inhabit the earth. And these are conifers, or the conifer phyta, and the flowering plants. So they produce seeds where the embryo actually develops. Seeds are a method of sexual reproduction. The sperm and the egg of the plants actually come together to create uh, the embryo, which then grows within the seed. Whereas spores are a method of asexual reproduction. So spores are pretty much clones of the original plant. Here is a good summary slide. If you wanna pause this video, you can, and you can uh, write down notes or just review this slide to study. Objective number eight says name the characteristic features that distinguish each of the following animal phyla and recognize examples of each. Before we get into the characteristics that you should know for each animal phyla, let me just emphasize that the phyla that you belong to, we are chordates. We are part of the phylum chordata, which makes up this, this little piece of the pie here. So this high chart shows the relative number of species for each phylum of animals. Notice that chordatas, or the chordates, only make up a small slice of this pie. Most animals are arthropods. Okay, so these include things like insects and stuff like that. So um, we are only just a small part of the animal uh, kingdom. So there are eight animal phyla that you should know. There's a lot more than eight animal phyla, but these are the eight most common uh, 
or most diverse groups of animals that exist on Earth today. And we're going to start off by going most simple to, or most primitive to organisms that are more complex. And um, the three characteristics that all an of these animals share are that they're multi-celled, eukaryotic, and they're heterotrophic by ingestion. So they actually have to ingest food through some sort of opening. So if we're going most primitive, we have the sponges, which are in the phylum periphera. Then we have the cnidaria, which include things like jellyfish. Then we have the platyhelminthes, which are the flatworms. The annelida, the segmented worms. Mollusca, which are organisms like snails, octopuses, uh, squid, slugs, things like that. And then we have our arthropods. Remember, these are the most diverse groups of animals. And then we have echinodermata, the second most diverse group. And then we have the chordata, um, which is the phylum that we belong to. So let's look at some of the characteristics that distinguish each one of these groups. So one way that we can char characterize or distinguish between the different phylums within animalia is their body form or the type of symmetry that they have. So some animals have bilateral symmetry. That means you can only split them one way to create a mirror image on both sides. Some of them have radial symmetry, and specifically this is the cnidarians or the jellyfish and sea anemones. So when, a, organi when an organism has radial symmetry, that means you can actually split them in any plane and it will create a mirror image. There are some organisms that actually don't have any symmetry at all. The only phylum that we are covering that does not have any symmetry are the sponges. And then uh, there is one phylum that is unique in that it has five-fold symmetry. And that are, that's the echinoderms, or like the starfish and sea urchins and things like that. So what this means is that there's five different planes in which you could actually split them to create a mirror image. Another way that we can categorize animals is based on whether they have a body cavity or not. We call this body cavity a coelom. So a coelom is an internal body cavity that provides cushioning for the internal organ um, organs. It also allows specialization of the digestive system by having this cavity surrounding the digestive system. One thing that will help you memorize what organisms have a coelom is that by having a coelom, it allows an organism to become more complex in a way. So the more primitive an organism is, the less likely it is to have a coelom. So what organisms don't have a coelom are the ones that are more simple, like the periphera, which are the sponges, cnidarians, which are things like the jellyfish, and the platyhelminthes, the flatworms. So notice how if we were to look at a cross section of this organism, there is no body cavity surrounding the digestive system. Whereas if we look at the earthworm, there's this large coelom or body cavity surrounding its digestive system. All right, let's start with the sponges. Sponges belong in the phylum porifera. Easy to remember, a sponge has many pores. The phylum name has pore in it. So it means it has a plethora of pores, many pores. Uh, sponges do not have a coelom. They are not segmented. Uh, they are sessile, which means that they do not move. They tend to, once they start growing into an individual, they don't move from that spot. One thing that's unique to sponges is that they have no symmetry at all. And they are filter feeders. So they actually will filter water through their body. They, they have special cells that can pull water through openings in their body. And then they can filter out the food as they, they pull this water through. Many people don't realize that sponges are animals. So here's a like one of my favorite videos. It's actually showing uh, a sponge actually pulling water, seawater through its body and then pushing it out through a central opening. And you can actually see how the sponge is actively feeding, constantly pulling tons of water through its body. It takes a few seconds for the dye to work its way through the sponge. <laughs> 
wait for it. But then it pours out like smoke from a chimney. That's pretty good pumping from those tiny little collar cells. Pretty cool, right? All right, so let's look at our next group, our phylum Cnidaria. Cnidaria means stinging cells. So that is something that's unique to this group. They use these stinging cells to actually feed. So the type of organisms that are Cnidarians include jellyfish, anemones, and coral. Many of you guys might have found coral on the beach washed up on the shore and it looks like just a hard stony skeleton. Well, that's because it really is just the skeleton of the coral that you're finding. When coral is alive, it actually exists as many little polyps that look like tiny little anemones inside the pores um, within that skeleton, or inside the openings there. And those little anemone looking polyps, we call them, actually are little individuals that live in this colony together. So notice all the Nidarians have a similar body plan to them, similar body structure. They don't have a coelom, they're not segmented. Most of them are sessile, so they can't move. Uh, they have radial symmetry, so you can split them in any plane to create a mirror image. And one thing that is very unique to these Nidarians is their specialized stinging cells that they use uh, to capture prey. These are some of the most complex cells in the animal kingdom. And uh, if any of you have been stung by a jellyfish, then you're probably a little more familiar with these cells than you'd like to be. So here's a really cool video just showing how these cells work. If you simulate even a severed strand of tentacle with an electric pulse, the stinging capsules react. Known as an amatocyst, the stinging capsule is unique to jellyfish. It's a complicated mechanism, and the fastest in the animal kingdom. Each tentacle contains billions of these harpoon-like structures. The process underlying their deadly firepower is revealed now for the first time using computer animation. Inside each of these nematocysts, a coiled tube bathed in venom. When triggered, the nematocyst explodes into the victim at 10,000 times the force of gravity. Like a sock being pulled inside out, the tube averts, releasing venom from all sides of the harpoon directly into the bloodstream. So these stinging cells are not only used to capture prey, but they're also used for defense. Our next phylum is the platyhelminthes. Platyhelminthes means flatworms. So that is a characteristic of this group. Uh, the flatworms are platyhelminthes. So practice saying that word, platyhelminthes. Um, if you know how to say it, it's going to be easy for you to remember it. These include the marine flatworms, which are very colorful flatworms living in the ocean. These include planaria. These are very, very, very common flatworms that can be found in any stream around Columbia, Missouri, or any place. Just go to a stream, flip over a rock, and you'll find many of these little flatworms under the rock. Marine flatworms and planaria are free-living types of flatworms, whereas some flatworms are parasitic, like tapeworms. Tapeworms tend to parasitize mammals, and they will attach to the intestinal wall. They'll actually accidentally be, the eggs will be ingested, and then they will grow into a tapeworm within the intestines. And that tapeworm will just stay attached there and just feed off the nutrients um, provided by its host. Although this tapeworm looks like it has segments to it, remember flatworms are not segmented. Each one of these structures that looks like a segment is actually an egg sac that contains about 10,000 or more eggs. And that's how the tapeworms reproduce. They release these egg sacs um, from the host to spread and hopefully infect another individual. Another type of parasitic flatworm is flukes. So flukes tend to parasitize uh, many different mammals, including humans. 
and they will uh, pretty much infect different organs within the human and live within their organs. Remember the unique characteristic that all these guys share is this flattened body. Flatworms are, also have bilateral symmetry. Um, what, however, bilateral symmetry is shared by other animals, including humans. Right? We have bilateral symmetry. Next, we have the phylum Annelida. Annelida means segmented worms. This is our first animal phyla that has a coelom, so internal body cavity. The annelids include leeches. Notice their segmentation all over their body here and earthworms. Earthworms are also highly segmented. So again, this group, Annelida, includes the segmented worms. Here on the bottom picture, you can see a really large earthworm that's found in Australia that can grow as long as you are. So it can grow easily up to five to six feet. Here's showing a cross section of an earthworm and you can see in the white here, Surrounding the intestinal cavity is the coelom. So they have a very large body cavity that provides cushioning and allows more complexity in their structure. Then we have the phylum mollusca. I like to think of mollusca as slimy animals with mantles. Okay, mantles is the important thing here. Um, I'll talk about what that is in a second, but let's talk about examples of mollusks. These include things like clams, Snails, slugs, octopuses, and squids, and so forth. One thing that all these mollusks share is not a shell. Okay, notice, does a slug have a shell? No. Does an octopus have a shell? It does not. But what they do share is a special type of tissue called the mantle. So all mollusks have a mantle. This is a special type of tissue that and in ancestral uh, mollusks, it was able to secrete a shell. However, the shell has been lost in some mollusks like the slugs, for example, and the octopuses. However, if you were to look at the top of a slug right here, the tissue is actually um, textured very differently and structurally is a little bit differently. So this right here is the mantle or the special tissue um, that still exists in slugs. However, they don't have a, they don't have or produce a shell. Then we have our phylum Arthropoda. Remember, this is the most diverse group of animals. Arthropoda means jointed legs. These, this group contains organisms that have many jointed appendages. This includes things like insects, spiders, millipedes, lobsters, crayfish, flies, scorpions. All these things belong within this group arthropoda. They all have a coelom, they have a segmented body, and one thing that's unique to the arthropods is they have an outer skeleton, so an exoskeleton. Exo means outside, and so it means the skeleton's on the outside of their body. They also have many, many, many jointed appendages. These include their legs, uh, their tails, their antenna, and so forth. So they have all these jointed um, appendages on their body. And here you can see the obvious segmentation in this millipede here, as well as this ant, where it has its body is segmented into a head, thorax, and abdomen in this case. Then we have our phylum Echinodermata. Echino means spiny. Dermis or dermata means skin. So one characteristic of echinoderms is their spiny skin. This includes things like sea, uh, starfish, including brittle stars shown here. It also includes, includes sea urchins. Sea urchins are like a little ball of spines, if you're not familiar with them. It includes sea cucumbers and things like sand dollars. Sand dollars are also echinoderms. Notice it looks like a little starfish on the back of that uh, sand dollar. So what is unique about the phylum Echinodermata? They have spiny skin. Also, they have a special type of symmetry called five-fold symmetry. So for most echinoderms, you can split their body in five different planes to create mirror images on both sides. Our last phylum, which includes us, is Chordata. And here I abbreviated the three characteristics that are very important 
um, in categorizing or distinguishing a chordate from all the other animals. And we will go over that in a second. Uh, before we go into the characteristics, just remember the type of organisms that belong in this group. These are probably the organisms that you're most familiar with, including reptiles, fish, mammals, amphibians, birds, and one group you're probably not familiar with but you should know, that is um, Amphioxus. And I'll talk about Amphioxus a little bit um, uh, in the next slide. So what three characteristics distinguish chordates or make something a chordate? Well, the three characteristics are that sometime in their life, so this could be when they're an embryo, um, during embryonic development, but sometime during the lifespan of a chordate, they possess what's called a dorsal nerve cord. In humans, the dorsal nerve cord eventually becomes a spinal cord or the brain. So this dorsal nerve cord is present when we're an embryo. They also have a notochord. This is a support rod or structure that goes along um, the dorsal nerve cord. And they also have pharyngeal gill slits, these tiny little slits in their throat. So again, remember that, that in some chordates, these characteristics are lost during development. And in, in only a few do they remain throughout their entire life. And an example of a chordate where these three characteristics remain even when they're an adult is Amphioxus. Amphioxus is a worm-like chordate and it actually uh, lives in the bottom of the ocean and you can see it's, it usually embeds its body in the sediment and its head sticking out on one end. It kind of looks a little bit like you could think of a, a fish or it looks a little bit like a worm. Um, but one thing that's unique to Amphioxus is that it maintains all three chordate characteristics throughout its entire life even as an adult. So they have a dorsal nerve cord, notochord, and pharyngeal gill slits. If you look at a cross section here of Amphioxus, you can see here the dorsal nerve cord is right here, the notochord is right here, and here's the pharynx with all the little slits around here. All right, so those are all the objectives for chat for unit nine. Uh, this unit is probably the most difficult in that you just have a lot to memorize. So. I will also post an additional video and the additional video will be like a little practice quiz where you can practice recalling the taxonomic um, terms and test yourself with that.